you very much, Dr. Kitahara. Can everybody hear me loud and clear? Thank you. Well, konnichiwa. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's my second time in Japan, but I've never been to Hokkaido before, and I really, really enjoy it. Now, actually, I shouldn't be standing here because according to the program, my, my colleague, Mike Steele, was supposed to give this lecture, but Mike was uh, unfortunately not come here, so I'm his replacement. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Well, by the end of this talk, you will know about the vital 90 days. You will know about the challenges that cows, or at least two major challenges that the cow faces through this period. You will uh, also uh, know about the consequences of having ketosis. You will even be able to set some costs on having disease during the vital 90 days. And maybe some of you even get inspired by this talk, maybe to look at your work in a different way, maybe to play a different role as a bovine practitioner. But let's start some, somewhere else. The world is in transition. Because we have the global milk market, and that is a changeable beast. It's very unpredictable. It is determined by supply and demand. And if you look at, these, at this graph, this is an outlook that I have got from the IFCN, and I really need to acknowledge them for letting or allowing me to present that here. But it's an outlook until 2030. And what it shows is that there will be an annual growth of milk <coughs> consumption, milk demand by 2.3 percent until 2030. So for sure, the demand will be there, and it is there because population, the global population will increase. Now we know that because the UN has made an outlook and it shows clearly that the global population will increase until the end of this century and then it will stagnate around 11 billion people. What also happens is that income will increase. Fortunately, more and more people will leave extreme poverty and they will enter into a kind of a middle class if you look at it globally and they will actually have money also to spend on milk. So that's very positive and that's on the one hand side. On the other side, we also know that land availability will decrease. And actually, if you look into the statistics of the UN, you can see that Besides China, every, almost all countries, there is a stagnation of the size of, uh, of uh, agricultural uh, land. Uh, and even in some countries, it's, it's about to decline. But the demand for milk is there, and who is going to produce that milk? Well, if you look at this outlook from the from the OECD and FAO that was produced in 2050 and goes until 2024. The European Union will produce a lot of more milk and definitely India. India will actually take the lead in milk production and then comes the United States. And if you look at Japan, actually what the outlook says is that the production of milk in Japan will decrease a little bit. So you're actually uh, about to, to prove that wrong, I hope. But the question is, what do we actually tell farmers? What should they do? Should they produce uh, more milk? Should they get more efficient, increase technology? Well, I will share with you what happened in, uh, in Denmark in 2015. And that's when the, when the European quota system ceased. And many, many Danish farmers 
were prepared for that and just waited so that they could produce all the milk they wanted. Unfortunately, the Danish farmers were not the only ones to have that idea. So a lot of farmers around Europe started to produce a lot of milk and we built up what we like to call a milk lake. Now that resulted in lower prices and actually some of those farmers went bankrupt. On the other hand, this year we have had a drought in Denmark which means that a lot of the crops that were grown for, for cattle feed actually not, not uh, resulted in very good harvest. And that means that a lot of farmers could see that they wouldn't be able to feed their cows. So they started slaughtering a lot of their cows, which means that there was produced less milk and prices were increasing. So this is very unpredictable. And we, we, we never know what is going to happen with, uh, with milk prices. So the question is actually, what should we do? When the wind blows strong, if prices are high or the demand is high, should we produce a lot of milk? Or should we be more conservative and say, well, we'll just wait. Maybe we'll just stay with our local market. It's really, really difficult to, to advise about this. But I think what we can agree upon is that if we can reduce the cost of milk production, essentially by reducing the occurrence of disease that has an impact on milk production, I think that is, in my view, the right way to go. And this is actually what the Vital 90 Days is about. So the Vital 90 Days is defined at the period from approximately two months prior to calving, that's around dry off, and until 30 days after calving, after the early lactation period. And we know from a lot of studies, from a lot of science, that the diseases that occur during these 30 days after calving they can actually be a result of how the cow is managed in the 60 days before calving. Transition to transitions. Why do I write that? Well, most of us were taught in vet school that the transition period is the period from 30, or oh, sorry, from three weeks before calving until three weeks after calving. And more or less defined as one transition period. But in reality, actually, the cows go th through a series of transitions that start at dry off and continues into early lactation. So it's not actually a single time period. It's much more a collection or a 90-day collection of transitions. And many of these are interrelated, and the incidence and the impact of many of the diseases we see during the early lactation can be attributed to management during this period. So this is a very, very critical period for the dairy cow. Look at this picture and just think about what is happening. Now, I assume that my Danish colleagues, and there are actually two Danish colleagues here in the room, they think about the size of the carving pen, maybe the quality of the bedding. Oh, well, yes, and one of the cows actually carved and the other one didn't. But what actually relies beyond this is that these cows either have been going through changes, transitions, are right in a transition, the one that has calved, or are about to go through transitions because they are going to change the diet. The cow is going from mostly 
roughage feeding to concentrate feeding. It's going to speed up its milk production. So a lot of changes are going on and are about to go on with these cows. Now if we look at them, look, fetal growth has been going on. There has been mammary gland involution around drying off. A lot of hormonal changes going from high tops with uh, progesterone to high tops or high peaks with uh, uh, estrogen. Colostrogenesis is going to happen with the draw of energy and calcium on the cow. The calving itself, which can be quite traumatic for the cow, a lot of stress hormones, a rapid increase in milk production post-calving, and definitely a change in the dry matter intake from before to after calving. Now, two of the major challenges for these cows during this period are immune suppression and negative energy balance. Now just think about, if you as a practitioner could make a big impact on farmers' income and their satisfaction with their work, if you could help them to identify pain points during the vital 90 days, and limit the system variation so that they don't have periods with a lot of disease and periods maybe with not so much disease, but try to keep the farm at a low, steady level. Now, this is what the Vital 90 Days is about. It is a platform that gives you the opportunity to act as an advisor for the farmers, to help them to become a partner. Wouldn't that really be nice to be a partner instead of they are looking at you as a cost that they cannot avoid? Now, when I started in practice, that was back in 1990, I went into a mixed practice and the bovine work I did was around 90, 95% of my time treating cows and doing firefighting. And by firefighting, I mean actually treating acute cases of mastitis, retained placenta, metritis, doing cesarean cut, and so on and so forth. I almost never spent time talking about prevention with the farmer, or neither did I do any coaching. Now, if you look at bovine practitioners nowadays in Denmark, they typically work in practices with around 10 colleagues maybe, seven to 10 colleagues. They only work with bovine medicine. They are experts. They don't earn any money, almost no money on prescribing medicine they earn most of their money on advisory work. So what they do is they visit farms daily, maybe three to four farms, and they do a lot of examination of cows at risk, which means cows in early lactation. They write reports, and they try to motivate farmers to change things that are not as they should be. So that is how it is to work as a bovine practitioner, for the most at least, in Denmark. Now that may seem scary, because if you are mostly doing fire fighting work, it can be overwhelming actually to see yourself as, as an advisor. So, because what is it that you should put into that work? So you actually have to acquire new skills. But wouldn't it really be nice to be seen as a partner for the farmer rather than 
Now we have the vet at the farm again, so an animal is sick. Now the two major challenges during the vital 90 days are the negative energy balance and very simply put, I don't know whether some of you joined uh, the presentation from Dr. Ursel yesterday, but, but this is a very uh, simplistic uh, approach to, to, uh, to this. But at the end of the day, it's a question of that the energy that goes into the cow is outweighed by the energy that goes out of the cow, which means essentially into milk production. And we know that the energy requirements for lactation essentially double after calving. And feed intake is not adequate to support that milk production. Now this can be seen from this little table here where they are following some Holstein cows from three weeks before calving until 80 days after calving. Now look how the dry matter intake changes. Look how milk production takes off after calving and look how much body weight these actually lose during the lactation. Now more visually what you can see here is the blue line here are the energy requirements that the cow has after calving and this is actually the intake in energy that the cow has and clearly there is a gap between these two lines and that is what we call the negative energy balance. On the other hand, cows are fighting against immune suppression. And this is a dysfunctional immune response primarily based on an impaired neutrophil function. So what you see here in this graph is, on the y-axis, is a measure of light emission from neutrophils. Because when neutrophils produce oxygen radicals, they send out light. And the more radicals they actually produce, the more light they send out. And what do they use these radicals for? Well, they use them to kill bacteria. So, this is an indirect measure of the ability of these neutrophils to kill bacteria. And what happens is that around two weeks before calving, until two to three weeks after calving, the ability to kill bacteria is relatively low. And this is what it's all about for the neutrophil. The neutrophil is the first line of defense. Whenever bacteria or other pathogens invade the organism, the neutrophils will be the first line of defense, the first cells to be there to engulf bacteria and kill them. So that's dramatically decreased around Kelvin, the ability to kill these. So that's another thing that the cow is fighting against. Now look at this cow. I mean, all of you most likely have seen this kind of cow before. And it, to the farmer, this means a lot of time, care, frustration, disappointments, maybe even death of the cow that he then needs to replace. But what we know is that during the first 14 days after calving and the week before calving is the period where we do have the majority of all production diseases. And these data are actually without metritis. They are without retained placenta. And still, the majority of diseases is within this period. And this is based on... Uh, data from 150,000 cows. And you know that because you meet that every day. And some 
scientists actually talk about a natural immune suppression that occurs in most cows during very late pregnancy and early lactation. Now, why do they get it? Well, some of it may be natural physiological conditions. I mean, if you think about the pregnancy, a lot of different hormones uh, around the body, uh, a lot of stress also with pregnancy. We have parturition, uh, where there will be a lot of stress, there will be negative energy balance. We know cow that lose weight during the dry period, that get fat infiltration in the liver, will have a suppressed uh, immunity. We know that increase of ketone bodies, increase of NEFA, also acts on the immune system and depresses the immune system. There can also be primary infectious diseases like BVD or mycoplasma or salmonellosis that will uh, uh, act on the immune system. Then we have the stress that can either be natural around parturition or it can be management induced if the farmer is actually relocating his, his animals too late. Maybe the calf pen is overcrowded. The stress for, for heifers actually to go into the calving pen and, and then afterwards uh, uh, be milked together with the older cows. And finally, we can induce immune suppression. If you actually treat cows with dexamethasone, with a steroid, you will induce immune suppression for a short period. What we know scientifically is that the prepartum mammary gland is highly susceptible to new infections. And we know that because there are several studies that show that more than 25% of all mastitis cases in a lactation occur within the first 14 days after, after calving. And since you saw the last slide, you already know that the postpartum dairy cow also is highly susceptible to clinical disease. Now what you maybe don't know is that the degree and the duration of immune suppression is correlated with the increased incident and the severity of clinical mastitis, metritis, and retained placenta in these postpartum cows. Now that was already shown 24 years ago by Kay and co-workers. They actually showed that, oh sorry, they showed that the more pronounced, the more pronounced the dysfunction is in neutrophils, the more disease we have, the more retained placenta, the more metritis, and the more mastitis. So actually, almost all cows will go through some degree of immune suppression. You can see even those cows that are normal here, they still have a decline in the function and the ability to kill bacteria. But they, they cope with that. Whereas others, where we have a more pronounced decline in the ability to kill bacteria, they have more disease. So we know that correlation. Now ketosis, I mean you know, everybody knows ketosis. It's a metabolic disorder uh, and simply put, when the cow mobilizes too much fat to meet uh, the demands for milk production, uh, that rate or that uh, mobilization rate will actually often be too fast and the cow's liver will not be able to oxidize these fatty acids to get the energy. So there will be an incomplete oxidation and thereby we do build up ketone bodies. And you know them, it's acetone, it's acetoacetate and it's beta-hydroxybutyrate or BHBA. Now ketosis is defined as being blood values of BHBA above 1200 to 1400 micromole per liter. And the primary risk period for this disease is two weeks after calving. Now we know that we have, you know that we have two forms of the disease. Uh, clinical form, which is the tip of the iceberg. We don't see a lot of, of clinical cases, uh, at least not uh, in uh, where I come from. Uh, 
it's relatively easy to diagnose. You have uh, very clear symptoms, whereas the hidden or the subclinical form of disease doesn't have these very overt symptoms. Now, we learned from Dr. Ertzel yesterday that actually they do have clinical signs if we look for them. But usually we don't see them if we don't look for them. Now, the subclinical part or form is much more uh, common, uh, and we see averages of 30% of fresh cows that have ketosis. Now, there's a big variation from farm to farm. In some farms, they maybe only have around 5%. And in other farms, maybe 50%, 60% of cows with uh, ketosis. Now, in fact, maybe we shouldn't call it subclinical ketosis, but we should call it hyperketonemia. Because we know that uh, cows that have levels already slightly above 1,200 micromoles per liter will start showing signs of, of, uh, of ketosis, and, and it will have consequences for the cow. And those consequences we are going to look um, uh, for. Now, in 2014, uh, a study was published that uh, Elanco uh, uh, conducted in five different European countries with 4,700 cows and 131 dairy farms. Now, these cows were tested from between 7 to 21 days after calving, and they were tested with a keto test, so they were tested for BHBA in milk. Further on, these cows were tested every second week until two months after calving, and they went through a clinical examination, a standard clinical examination. One of the results that was shown here is that 85% of all these farms had 25% or more of fresh cows with ketosis. So this is a very, very common disease. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about inputs into the Vital 90 Days. Now the inputs that we do and that farmers typically do during the Vital 90 Days are an effort to maintain welfare and get the cow to the most profitable part of a lactation cycle. And typically, those inputs are placed in one of these buckets. I mean, either it's some management practices they change or initiate, or they do some dietary uh, adjustments or even uh, some feed supplementation. They initiate or change vaccine plans they do different kinds of mastitis control or prevention of mastitis, or they launch some monitoring programs, could typically be around ketosis. Now, doing the right thing during the vital 90 days is actually a real, a real puzzle. Because there's no doubt that farmers actually do this with a, with a, with a clear goal to try to prevent disease from happening in these cows. But I mean, not all of the things they are doing are scientifically documented. So I see actually here also a role for you as a practitioner to help farmers actually initiating the right strategies. And you can see there's a lot going on during the vital 90 days. And we actually asked some colleagues, some bovine practitioners, to come up with actions during the Vital 90 Days they did, that they think were very important. Now look at this. I mean, they came up with a huge number of different actions that they thought were important during the Vital 90 Days. And it's not really fair, actually, because it's not only, it's not only very, very important and critical period for the cow, but it is also a very, very busy time for the farmer. And the farmer needs help to sort this out, to find out what is the right strategy, because he cannot do all of this, and he shouldn't do all of this. But they should do the right thing 
and the thing that works for them at their farm. And you are the, actually the only one who can guide them in this. Now, the consequences. And you, you, I need to remind you about that the impact of of negative energy balance and moon suppression are not only on the health and the well-being and, and the production of the, of the dairy cow, but it is also on, if you will, the mental health of the farmer. Because farmers get frustrated if they have these too many cows that are sick. And it has an impact on the profitability of the dairy operation and maybe is something that depicts whether the farm has a success or not. So we want to help the farmer, actually, to have fewer cases of milk fever, to cull fewer cows, to have less reproductive orders and less dead cows, because all of this gives a lot of frustration for farmers and it doesn't really make them happy about being a farmer and working as a farmer. So if you look at this, think about what is it that the farmer sees of this. He sees this death, calling, and reproductive disorders. That's what he sees. You, as a professional, you have a different approach. You see what's behind all this. You see, if there's a lot of mastitis, retained placenta, or metritis, you can speculate that maybe there is a problem with the immune suppression in this farm. Or maybe there's a lot of ketosis, and you say, well, we do have a problem with, with energy balance, negative energy balance. And you see, or you can at least measure, how many cows have hypocalcemia in this, in this herd. And I dare to say that if you actually can control this and do some strategies against these three major issues, you are really on a good way to prepare a good lactation for cows in that, in that herd. Now, how do we know that they have immune suppression? How do we know that they struggle with negative energy balance? Well, I just told you, you need to know how much disease there is at the farm. And to do that, it's really, really important that you keep records of disease. And to keep records of disease demands that you have a standardized, a fixed set of diagnostic criteria so that you use these criteria every time you diagnose a disease. Because otherwise, it's impossible for you actually to compare diseases. And it's difficult for you to say, well, we want to start a strategy against hypocalcemia. So we have a, a point A where we start up and where we have maybe a prevalence of 15%. And then you want to evaluate the strategy after 15, or sorry, after two months or something like that. To be able to do that, you need to diagnose the disease the same way every time. Otherwise, you wouldn't know whether it is the strategy that you initiated that really does the job or not. Now, I'm not going through this, but this is just, just a set of definitions for diseases. And it, it's really not important that it, is right, that it is this definition you use, but it is important that you have a definition. Now, further consequences. I mean, it's not just about having a case of ketosis, but we know that cows that are hyperketonemic, they have an increased risk of getting another disease. Now, look at this. This is, this is a graph here showing odds ratios, which means that cows that are hyperketonemic are three to eight times more likely also to get displaced abomasum than cows that are not hyperketonemic. And look how much risk there is with ketosis to attract or to develop another disease. So it's not only about the case of disease. And you know that the farmer, 
does not know this. So you must teach the farmer. Another study showing that a case of ketosis will cost 2.2% of milk if you look at the whole lactation yield of a cow. And furthermore, you can see that the conception rate is down to 28% within the first two months after calming, which makes it very, very difficult to get this cow with a calf, which means that this will cost the farmer money because he has to feed the cow for a longer time without her being pregnant. And on top of that, every ketosis case, you lose about seven days of milk. Again, costs for the farmer. Now, if you go back to this, to this uh, prevalence study I was talking about before, we can see that you remember that the cows, they were actually clinical examined every second week within two months. So, so they were all, also diagnosed with some of the other diseases that occurred. And when they were tested, they found out that, well, for example, cows with retained percent of 50% of these cows, or close to 50%, were also hyperketonemic. Now, I'm not going to argue or discuss what comes first here, but, but essentially what we can see is that most of these deceased cows are also hyperketonemic. So, please don't ignore subclinical or hidden ketosis. It increases the risk dramatically for other diseases and it will give economic losses. Now, let's try and see whether we can actually put some costs on these diseases. And the goal here is actually to come up with a figure, with a number that gives you an idea of what it costs to bring a cow through the vital 90 days and into calving. Now, the costs can be split up to investment costs, and that'll be costs that the farmer have to prevent diseases. So that could be vaccination, that could be hoof trimming, and so on. And then we have the consequence cost, that further can be split up in direct costs, which means anything that the farmer needs to pay for treatment of a disease. So that will be the medicine and it will be the bill for the veterinarian. That will be the direct cost. And finally, we have the indirect costs. And the indirect costs are actually some of them I showed to you before and on some of the, the previous slides. Those are the costs for the loss of milk. Those are the costs for having another, a secondary disease after having ketosis and a lot of other consequences. So the goal here is actually to strive to lower the consequence cost to improve the profitability of the dairy operation. Now this can be done either by improved management or appropriate investments, but also by refining actually your treatment decisions. But do we actually know what it costs? What are the preventive costs? Well, if we look at data, we can actually come up with costs. And of course, these are average costs and uh, they maybe don't apply to your country. They may be different in different countries. They may be different in different herds. But we can actually come up with figures here that shows how much preventive costs there are during the vital 90 days. And then Elanco has made the work actually to put in, and this is based actually on a huge data set with around 50,000 carvings. They've come up with what it costs to have disease in first lactation cows and in older cows. And they 
have done the mathematics, they have calculated that the investment costs in first lactation cows or older cows, depending on the proportion of uh, these groups of cows, and, and typically here they, they assume 30% of the cows will be first lactation and the rest will be older cows, come up with an overall figure by adding these investment costs, the direct costs and the indirect, indirect costs to an overall figure. So this is the figure, in Europe at least, this in the US, to get a cow through the vital 90 days if you have a recurrence of, of these diseases at that percentage. Now that will differ, of course it will. And actually Elanco has made now a, a tool where you actually can put in numbers for the particular herd you are working with. And that means what you can do right now is that you can see, well, if I want to lower the incidence of ketosis, let's say from 70 or 27% down to like 15%, you can actually put that into the system and the system will show you what does that mean for the overall cost for a cow during the vital 90 days. Well, of course, it will lower that number. And this is a way how you actually can show the farmer that if we do this, if this strategy really works, this will be the outcome. This is the money you will save. Now, some more numbers. There's a colleague from France who have modeled the cost of ketosis to being around 257 euro per case, and then that equals uh, 33,000 Japanese yen. And, uh, and that goes for cows that, uh, that produce around 10,000 kilograms of, of milk, and where the margin over feeding costs is around 120 euro per ton of milk. Now let's assume we have a herd with 100 cows, and a prevalence of ketosis of 25%. That will cost the farmer around 1 million Japanese yen a year. Not because there will not be 100 carvings a year, there will be 130 carvings. Because typically, in farms, you will have a culling rate of about 30%. So think about if you could actually halve the prevalence of ketosis in farm and free around half a million Japanese yen that the farmer could use for something else. Now, what is it that contributes to this price? Well, we've talked about it before, but he also showed it that cows get earlier called, they develop abomasal displacement, they have a lower milk production, they get lame, they get clinical mastitis. So that is what contributes to these costs. Now, these are a lot of numbers we are talking about, but at the end of the day, it is really, really important that you also remember that this is also about emotions. There's nothing worse for a farmer than starting the day by going by the sick pen and see a lot of sick cows. And if you have ketosis, we now know that there will be a lot of other diseases as well at the same time. So it tends to fill up the, the sick pen. So this is really demoralizing, it's tiring, and it's stressful for the farmer. You need to acknowledge that. But on the other hand, you also need to explain to farmers that we cannot eradicate this disease. There will always be ketosis. So He's not a bad farmer because he has 3 to 5% of ketosis in his fresh cows. Well, with that, I'd like to, to sum up and remind you that the vital 90 days is defined at the as the time frame from 60 days prior calving to 30 days post-calving. And that is when cows typically are challenged by negative energy balance and immune suppression. 
Now, all the inputs we were talking about are made during the vital 90 days, are an effort to maintain welfare and reduce negative consequences of transition cow diseases and get the cow to a healthy start. And I want more like to underline that you, as a practitioner, are central persons in this. And with the vital 90 days, you actually have a platform now where you can focus on this extremely critical period for the cow and where you can become an advisor for the farmer. And Elanco will definitely be your partner in, in this attempt uh, with the knowledge and with the science that, uh, that we have. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention and, uh, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy the rest of, uh, of the conference here in Sapporo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doctor.